Now, first of all, when we talk about uh, what you refer as a, a group, <clears throat> uh, generally we are referring to a group of companies. When we talk about a group of companies, we are talking of uh, the parent company and its subsidiaries. So therefore, when we talk about uh, the group, and that is specifically a group of companies, but generally we talk of the group, we are talking of uh, the parent uh, company and its subsidiaries the parent company and its subsidiaries. So this is what you refer to as a group or a group of companies. Now, what is a parent company? Uh, what is a parent company? A parent company is a company having a control, a company having control, uh, having control over uh, another company, over another company which is known as a subsidiary, which is known as what? A subsidiary. So in this case, when we talk about a company having a control of another company, this means that uh, the parent company uh, hold majority of the shares or hold majority of the ordinary shares issued by the other company, which we are referring to as the, the subsidiary company. For instance, if we are told uh, a limited uh, acquired more than 50% of the issued ordinary shares of the issued ordinary shares of a B limited, then in this case, we say that A limited has acquired control of a B because we know that once a company has acquired more than 50% of the issued ordinary shares of another company, then this company will be in a position to control all the financial and operating decisions made by this company and also Number two, this company is in a position to control the composition of the board of directors of company B. So, and therefore, in this case, we say that this is a parent company because it has a control of a company B, whereas well company B here is a, a subsidiary. Now, the, the parent company here a, and its subsidiary company, this is now what you find as a group. This is what you find as a, a group, or basically what you find as a the a group of companies. Now, what we know uh, from company law is that this parent company has an obligation to prepare a group accounts or to prepare consolidated financial statement. That's something you have covered in company law that any holding company or any parent company uh, has an obligation to prepare group accounts. And in fact, you are told that uh, when the parent company is preparing the group account, then uh, what happened is that the veil of incorporation is lifted, or in other terms, the separate legal personality of the parent company and that of the subsidiary is ignored. So mean that for the purpose of preparing the group account, the parent company and its subsidiaries are viewed to be one and the same entity. So that means whenever the parent company is to prepare this group account, it is supposed to add similar items of asset liabilities revenue and expenses, and those of the parent and those of the uh, subsidiary. That's why we say during the preparation of the group account, the veil of uh, the, the, the separate equal personality of the parent and uh, that of the subsidiary is what is ignored. Now, the other term which you also need to define here is a term called business combination. Business combination. When we talk about the business combination, this is the process through which uh, or basically is that transaction, is that transaction uh, whereby the parent company, the parent company acquires control, acquires control uh, over, or acquires control, acquires control, uh, acquires control of another company, of another uh, company. So anytime we are told the parent company acquired majority of the shares in another company, that transaction itself, uh, whereby the parent company is acquiring control, is acquiring what? Control uh, over another company, we refer to it as a business combination. So business combination, we can see, is a process through which A Limited has acquired majority of the shares in company what? In company B. That transaction itself, we refer to it as a business combination. The other term, uh, which is also important for you to know is a term which is called the non-controlling interest. The non-controlling interest or NCI. 
So what is non-controlling interest on MCI? Non-controlling interest on MCI, this is a, a, or these are the shares issued by the subsidiary company, but not held by the parent. So we can say is part of, part of uh, shares, part of the shares and specifically ordinary shares issued by a subsidiary company, is issued by subsidiary company and not held and not held by a subsidiary company. Sorry, and not held by parent company. Not held by parent company, not held by parent company. So meaning that if we are told that a limited, for example, acquired 80% uh, of the shares of uh, B limited, it means that uh, shares issued by this company, 80% of them are held by the parent company, which now become the major shareholder. Uh, and that's why we are saying that the parent company being the major, major shareholder in B limited, it is in a position to control company B. It controls all the decis uh, decisions, financial and operating decisions made by B limited. And also it controls the composition of the board of directors. For any person to be appointed as a director of B limited, there must be a concept of uh, uh, B limited. There must be a concept of B limited because, B, uh, sorry, there must be a concept of A limited because A limited is a majority shareholder. So meaning that uh, the remaining 20% of the shares issued by limited are held by who? They are held by, uh, by minority shareholders. 20% uh, of the shares issued by this company, uh, those shares are held by minority shareholders. And the minority shareholders, they have some interest there. So basically, anytime you acquire some shares in a company, we say that you have acquired, you have acquired some, you, 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 have, you have some interest in that company. <clears throat> you have some, acquired some shares, you have some interest in that company. Your interest in that company is measured in terms of the number of shares you have acquired. Like in this case, we say that because the parent company has acquired majority of the shares in this company, then the parent company has a control, which is called controlling interest, which is called controlling interest. The interest of the, minor, of the parent company is a controlling interest simply because <clears throat> the parent company is in a position to control all the operating and financial decisions made by <clears throat> a company B or B limited, but the minority shareholders here, they are not in a position to control the decisions made by B limited. In other terms, we say that the minority shareholders, they have an interest which is a non-controlling interest. So therefore, when we talk about the non-controlling interest, we are talking of <coughs> the interest of the minority shareholders. The, minority, the interest of the minority shareholders is, uh, is determined by the shares they hold. And that's why we are saying non-controlling interest on NCI is part of the ordinary shares issued by the subsidiary company, but not held <coughs> by the parent, but not held by what? The parent a company. So therefore, these are some of the, the terms we should be in a position to define as far as the group accounting is concerned, as far as group accounting is, is concerned. Now, when this uh, group accounts are to be prepared, in which case we have said they are supposed to be prepared by the parent company, the parent company which has a subsidiary or which uh, has a number of subsidiaries is supposed to prepare the group account. Now, this group account are prepared in compliance with various standards, <clears throat> various standards. One of the standards uh, which governs the preparation of uh, a group accounts is uh, IFRS 3, IFRS 3, and IFRS 3 deals with the business combination, deals with the business combination. What is a business combination? Business combination, remember you have seen, is a process through which now the company, which is called the parent company, acquires control of another company, which you have referred to as what? The subsidiary. Generally, we have seen that the parent company acquires a control of a subsidiary. Once the parent company has acquired shares, uh, which lies between 51% to 100%, acquires ordinary shares, uh, which lies between 51% uh, to 
percent. We say the parent company has acquired a control. So that transaction through which the parent company acquires control over a subsidiary, we refer to that a transaction as a business combination, as a business combination. Now, this particular standard here, IFRS 3 requires that on the date the parent company has acquired control of a subsidiary, the parent company should determine the goodwill arising from such a acquisition, from such what? Acquisition, from such acquisition. Now, when determining that goodwill, or first of all, uh, we'll talk about now the goodwill arising on business combination or arising on acquisition. Generally, this is the difference. Goodwill is the difference between is the difference between uh, between a, a purchase consideration is the difference between purchase consideration paid paid and net asset acquired and net assets acquired and net asset uh, acquired net asset acquired. For instance, let's assume that today you are to buy an existing business. You are to buy an existing business. And maybe uh, you have negotiated with the owners of that business and you have agreed that you should pay a purchase consideration. Purchase consideration is what you pay when, for example, purchasing an asset, when purchasing an existing business. So assuming you have negotiated with the owners and you have negotiated a, that you pay a price of how much? 100 million as a result of acquiring that existing business. But the fair value of the net asset you have acquired the fair value of the net asset you have acquired or the net asset, the fair value of the net asset in that business, they have, a, or basically the net asset in that business have a fair value of 80 million. So basically what that means is that you have, uh, you are required by the owners to pay a hundred million as a result of acquiring that business as a going concern, but uh, the net asset you have acquired, uh, they have a fair value of 80 million. So basically that means that you have paid an amount uh, which is more than the fair value of the net asset you have uh, acquired. So meaning that if there is something you have you have paid for, which is not part of the net asset. And that, uh, or that uh, item you have paid for, which is not part of this, and which is 20 million, that is good way. That is what good way. Anytime you buy an existing business, you have to, uh, in most of the cases, will be required by the owners to pay for goodwill. So what is goodwill? Goodwill are some of the benefits now which you will start enjoying as a result of uh, buying an existing business. Like what we know is that if you buy an existing business, that business is already established. It has a system which is in place. That business is known. It has its own customers uh, and so on. So therefore, once you uh, buy an existing business, it's not the same with the uh, starting a new business. There are some benefits which are associated with that. Uh, so you have to pay for that. Uh, you have to pay for those benefits you'll start enjoying because you have bought an existing what? Business. So that uh, difference between purchase consideration you have paid and the fair value of the net asset you have acquired is good deal. Is what? Good deal. Of which now this good deal, once you have paid for it, you recognize it as an asset in your books of account. And then uh, the international accounting standard requires that at the end of each year, you need to determine whether that goodwill has lost, has decreased in value. Any decrease in the value of the goodwill is known as impairment loss, is known as impairment what? loss. Now, this particular uh, uh, goodwill, this goodwill on acquisition or this goodwill arising on business acquisition, uh, according to IFRS 3, may be computed using two methods, may be computed using two methods. One, uh, this goodwill, uh, so we have methods of computing the goodwill, it may be computed using a method which is known as the full, the full goodwill method, the full goodwill method. And number two, we have another method which is known as the partial, the partial goodwill method, the partial goodwill method. These are the two methods uh, which are used in terms of determining the goodwill arising from business acquisition or from business combination. So uh, start with the first method, maybe start with the, with the partial goodwill method, the partial uh, goodwill method. Uh, under this particular method here, we compute or the good deal determined is the, is the good deal of the parent company only, the good deal of the parent company. So the good deal determined here 
<coughs> is the goodwill of the parent company only, the parent company only. Because once the parent company has acquired majority of the shares in this subsidiary, then we determine, uh, we can determine the goodwill of the parent a company, the goodwill of the parent company. Remember in this particular subsidiary, we have two categories of uh, shareholders. We have the parent company, which is the majority shareholder, and we have the minority shareholders or MCI. So therefore, once this company has, a, has been acquired, you can determine the goodwill of the parent and the goodwill of MCI. MCI, when we talk about MCI, what should come into your mind is that we are talking of the minority shareholders of the subsidiary. So you can determine the goodwill of the parent, the goodwill of MCI, or <clears throat> the goodwill of both. So I'm saying at a partial goodwill method, we determine the goodwill of the parent company only. The goodwill of the parent company only. How do we determine that goodwill of the parent company only? One, we take into account something called the cost of investment. The cost of investment. What is the cost of investment? The cost of investment is the purchase consideration which was paid by the parent company when investing in a subsidiary. So what you need to note is that once the parent company has acquired a subsidiary, the parent company is making an investment. Just like the other day when a KCB acquired majority of the shares in the National Bank of Kenya. So that acquisition of a majority of the shares by KCB in National Bank, KCB is, is, is or basically made an investment. Made what? An investment. So therefore, anytime the parent company has acquired a subsidiary, that is an investment by the parent company. So how much amount is paid, uh, how much cost was incurred by the parent company making that investment? So that purchase consideration paid. When the parent company acquired the majority of the shares in the subsidiary, we refer to that as cost of investment. But in other terms, I've said it can also be known as purchase consideration paid. So to this, we less, we less the fair value of fair value of net assets acquired, fair value of net assets acquired, fair value of net assets acquired. So what you get here, if you get a positive figure, that is good be, that is good on acquisition, or there are some cases where you can get a negative figure here. If you get a negative figure, we say that that is a gain, is a gain on a, is a gain on a bargain purchase. Basically what that means is that uh, the purchase consideration which was paid here was less than the fair value of the net asset acquired. Is a case whereby maybe you have acquired a business with a net asset of 8 million, 8 million, but you have negotiated with the owners and you have settled at a purchase consideration which is less than that 8 million. Maybe you have settled at a purchase consideration of 60 million. It, it means that you have paid an amount which is less than the, the, the net asset you have acquired. You have acquired that business at a profit. So that a profit to refer to it as, as a gain on bargain what purchase. Now this goodwill we have said is a is a, is an asset to the it should be recognized as an intangible asset by the parent company. But any gain on bargain purchase is immediately recognized as an income in the consolidated income statement. Is immediately recognized as an income. So therefore, that's how we compute the the goodwill arising on a business combination or arising on acquisition using the partial uh, goodwill method, using the partial goodwill method. And then we have the other method of uh, determining the goodwill on acquisition, and that is uh, uh, number, number two, we have the full uh, goodwill method, the full goodwill method. Now, under this particular method, as the name suggests, the goodwill determined is the goodwill attributable to the parent company and the goodwill of NCI. Remember NCI, we have said that these are like uh, the, the minority. These are like the minority shareholders. These are like the minority shareholders. So meaning that under this particular method, we compute the goodwill arising uh, from acquisition of this subsidiary. And that is the goodwill of the parent company, which is a majority shareholder here, and the goodwill of the minority shareholders, that is NCI. That's why we refer to it as full uh, goodwill method. We determine the goodwill of the parent company and the goodwill of what? NCI. How do we do that? 
we take the cost of investment, the cost of uh, investment, cost of investment. Remember the cost of investment you have said, this is a purchase consideration which was paid by the current company in acquiring majority of the shares in the subsidiary. To this, we add something called the NCI at fair value. <clears throat> NCI at fair value. So this figure always in an exam will be given. We, you will be given this figure. So mean that if you've come across a question and you're told the NCI at fair value was this amount. It is obvious when computing the goodwill, you're going to compute the goodwill using the full goodwill method. But there are some cases whereby this figure may not be given. If it is not given, you need to compute it. And how do you compute that? Remember here we are talking of NCI at fair value. NCI at fair value, you have seen, is the interest of the minority shareholders. So therefore, how do you determine the interest of the minority shareholders in the subsidiary? So to determine this, you take the number of shares or you compute the number of shares held by NCI, held by NCI. You have to determine how many shares are held by the minority shareholders here. To compute that is very simple because you, you, you will be given the shares issued by the subsidiary. For instance, you may be told the subsidiary has issued 1 million shares. And that means that if the parent company, for example, here acquired 80% of these shares, that means that the shares held by minority shareholders here will be 20% of 1 million. Of what? 1 million. That's how we determine the shares held by what? NCI. And then you multiply those shares with their fair value. With their fair value. Fair value is the market price per share, the price at which the shares of uh, the subsidiary are trading it in the security section market on the date of acquisition. On the date of acquisition. That's how we, we, we do that. And then to this, we list the fair value of net assets, fair value of net assets acquired, fair value of net assets <coughs> acquired, fair value of net asset, acquired of which in this case we take 100% of the net asset of the subsidiary because we are computing the goodwill of the parent and the goodwill of the NCI. So the difference there is what is the goodwill. The difference there is the goodwill. So that's how we determine <coughs> a the good deal arising uh, from business combination using the full good deal method. So therefore, it is important to note that anytime the parent company has acquired, uh, has acquired a subsidiary, you have to determine the good deal in, uh, arising from uh, that transaction, which is known as business combination, or which is, uh, arises from uh, business, uh, uh, from acquisition of the subsidiary by the parent. We have said we have two methods the full goodwill method and the partial goodwill method. But in an, in, a, in an exam, the examiner will not tell you which method to use, either full goodwill or partial, but definitely you will come across some information. You'll come across some information in the, or you'll be given some uh, information in the question. For instance, one, you can be told, or you can be given some information and you're told that it is the policy of the group. You may be given some information and you're told one, it is a policy of the group. It is the policy of the group, of the group, group to measure, to measure NCI, NCI at fair value, to measure NCI at fair what value. So basically, if you come across that information that is a policy of the group to measure NCI at fair value, you will be given this value here. You'll be given the value here, which is known as, or you'll be given a value known as NCI at fair value. And automatically, if you come across that information, and also you're given the NCI at fair value, that means that when computing now the goodwill, when computing the goodwill arising from acquisition, you compute the goodwill arising from acquisition using the full a goodwill method, the full goodwill word method, because you have been provided with this value here. So number two, you may also come uh, across some information. And uh, whoever you are told, number two, it is the policy of the group. It is the policy of uh, the group, of uh, the group to measure 
it is a group of the uh, it is a policy of the group to measure the NCI NCI at the uh, proportionate at their proportionate share of uh, fair value of uh, net asset. Proportionate share of the fair value of network asset. If you come across such information, that is the policy of the group to measure the NCI at their proportionate share of the fair value of the net asset, that means that when computing the goodwill, we compute the goodwill using the partial goodwill method. The partial goodwill what? Method. The partial goodwill method. So therefore, uh, here you need to note that the in an exam, the examiner will not tell you specifically which method to use. You will be you'll you'll be given such information. So, and therefore, from that information, you have to know which method you are going to apply in computation of the good in the computation of what of the good. So therefore, we have those as the two methods uh, which are used in determining the good deal arising from acquisition or uh, from business uh, combination. So that is all about uh, the good deal. So what I'll do once I share the, the notes on this, in the first page of those particular notes, you'll be able to see some, 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 some uh, an illustration of this. You'll be able to see an, an illustration on how we compute the good deal uh, using the full good deal method and also the partial good deal method. So you'll try to follow up on how we compute, or basically how we, yes, how we compute the good deal using the two methods, using those particular illustrations in the first page of the notes. In page one, I think of uh, the notes I'll share on this topic. So then from there, uh, we have something else uh, we need to cover here known as the forms of uh, purchase consideration. Remember what you have said here is that once the parent company has acquired a subsidiary, the parent company is supposed to pay <coughs> some amount of money. Once a parent company has acquired a subsidiary, it is obvious that uh, the parent company will have to pay some amount of money because it has acquired the majority of the shares in the, in the subsidiary. Now, the, the purchase consideration to be paid by the parent, to be paid by the parent company may take various forms, may take various what? Uh, forms. So which are the various forms of, uh, on which are these, the various forms the purchase consideration may take? One, the purchase consideration, uh, may be in form of cash. So in that case, we talk of cash consideration. We talk of uh, cash consideration. So when we talk about the cash consideration, this is a consideration which is paid, uh, which is paid in cash and also on the date of acquisition and also on the date of acquisition. Now this particular amount of cash consideration when computing the goodwill, remember is what we refer as a cost of investment. Remember, this is now what we refer as a cost of investment. So this particular amount uh, do not have any special treatment. This amount do not have any special treatment. When computing the goodwill, uh, we have said this amount do not have any special, any special treatment. So that particular amount, you use it the way it is given. Use that amount the way it is given. So if we are told the parent company have paid 200 million in acquiring majority of the shares in the subsidiary, when computing the good deal, your cost of investment would be 200 million, 200 million. And also it is important to know that, uh, or it is important to know how that particular amount is accounted for by the parent company. For example, assuming we have told that uh, A Limited, uh, for example, acquired 80%, of the shares in a B limited and paid 200 million, 200 million cash, 200 million cash. So how uh, is this among 200 million accounted for by the parent company? The parent company, which is A limited, will account for that as, a, as investment in a B limited. The amount it has invested in B limited is 200 million and then 
it will credit bank account. It will credit its bank account with the 200, that 200 million. So meaning that in the statement of financial position of uh, this company, in the statement of financial position of uh, A Limited, in the statement of financial position of uh, A Limited, specifically at a non-current asset, you'll be able to see something called investment in B Limited. This investment in B Limited is the cash consideration paid by A Limited in acquiring majority of the shares in what? In B. So that amount when computing now your goodwill, you use that amount the way it is given. So then from there we have the other form of purchase consideration, which is known as the deferred consideration deferred consideration. What is a deferred consideration? A deferred consideration, this is a, a purchase consideration uh, which the parent company has promised to be paid in the future. Is a purchase consideration uh, to be paid in the, uh, some time in the future uh, from the date the acquisition took place. For, for instance, we may be told that uh, the parent A limited acquired B limited on this date here maybe at the start of year one, but it has promised, A Limited, the parent company has promised to pay an additional cash, an additional cash of 300 million at the end of the second year from the date the acquisition took place, from the date the acquisition took place. Now this is a deferred consideration, is a deferred what? Consideration. Now, because this particular amount forms a part of the, the purchase consideration, which must be used in computation of goodwill, and that amount is to be paid in two years time, or is to be paid in future, then you can't use that amount uh, in computing your goodwill as 300 million. What you do is that this particular uh, consideration, which is to be paid in the future, you have to determine its present value. You have to determine its present what? Value. So therefore we say that any consideration which is to be paid in the future, it, it is discounted, it is discounted, it is discounted, discounted to its present value, to its present value. And when doing that, when discounting it to its present value, we use the parent company using, the, we use the parent company cost of capital. We use the parent company cost of capital. We use the parent company cost of capital. So we discount it, it is discounted to its present value using the parent company cost of capital. Basically what that means is that uh, the parent company here cost of capital will be your R, will be your R. Like maybe we assume that we are told the parent company has promised uh, to pay uh, maybe a cash of 200 million at the end of uh, the second year from the date of the acquisition uh, took place. And also we assume that uh, the parent company cost of capital, the parent company cost of capital is maybe a parent company cost of capital, a, a cost of capital now which you have said is R, maybe is 10%. Is 10%. So what does that mean? It means that this consideration, which is to be paid at the end of the second year, we need to get its present value. So we get the present value of the deferred consideration. Present value of the deferred consideration. So we take 300 million, now which is supposed to be paid at the end of the second year. So this is not an, an annuity. This is a lump sum, it's a single amount to be paid at the end of the second year. So therefore we multiply that with present value interest factor, which is given by one plus R raised to power negative N. So we take 300 million. So remember our R here would be the parent company cost of capital and assuming it is 10%, so we have 1.1 raised to power negative two. That amount will be paid at the end of second, uh, second year. So whatever you get there will be now your deferred consideration. When computing now uh, the goodwill, you use whatever you get here, the present value of the deferred word consideration and automatically that amount you have to amortize it. You have to write it off uh, in the next two years, in the next two what? years. So that's how we deal 
with this uh, purchase consideration, with this deferred consideration. The other type of uh, consideration or the other form uh, which the purchase consideration may take is a consideration which is paid through share exchange. Through what? Share exchange, a purchase consideration paid through share exchange. What is a purchase consideration paid through share exchange? This is a, a, a form of a consideration which is paid by the parent company uh, issuing its own shares. Remember here, when the parent company, for example, has acquired 80% of the shares in B Limited, it means that uh, majority of the shareholders of this company, of the subsidiary, they have accepted. They have accepted to sell majority of their shares to the parent company. So therefore, those majority shareholders of this company who have accepted to sell their shares to the parent, they have to be paid. They have to be paid. If I sell my shares to you, you have to pay me. So therefore, what happened here is that the parent company will not pay the, uh, the, the, the majority shareholders of the subsidiary in cash, but rather they are issued with lesser number of shares in this company. For example, if they have accepted to sell like 5 million shares of the subsidiary, this company may accept to, uh, to, to, to pay them by issuing them with like 2 million or 3 million shares, 3 million shares. So therefore, here, the purchase consideration is paid by the parent company by issuing its own shares. Now, in this case, how do we then determine the value of the purchase consideration? How do we determine the amount of purchase consideration which we use in computing goodies? So here, the purchase consideration which is paid through share exchange is determined by one, you determine the number of shares or basically, yes, the number of ordinary shares, shares issued, issued by parent company. How many shares were issued by the parent company to pay the purchase consideration? Then multiply that with a fair value per share, with a fair value per share. So the fair value per share is the same with MPS, is the same with the market price per, per share, is the same with the market price per share. So in this case, the we are talking of the market price per share or the market price, market price of the parent company shares, market price of uh, the parent company shares. So, and always, anytime you, this in fact is very, very common at your level, whether you're told the purchase consideration was paid, was paid through, was paid through share exchange. The purchase consideration was paid through what? Share exchange. So in most of the cases will be told that the parent company had not accounted for that purchase consideration because one, the examiner want to know you, want to know whether you're able to compute that purchase consideration paid through share exchange, you apply this formula. And also the examiner want to know whether you know how do uh, the shares which were issued by the parent company, how should they be accounted for? So this particular purchase consideration which was paid uh, through uh, share exchange, it is accounted for as follows. These are the, uh, the accounting entries which are supposed to be made. One, uh, we debit an account called the cost of uh, investment. The cost of investment is basically the purchase consideration paid, which is computed using that formula. And then here, remember generally, if for example, that amount was paid in cash, we credit it in the bank, but it, it, was, it was not paid in cash. It was paid by the parent company pay issuing its ordinary shares. So therefore, the account which is credited is the ordinary share capital of which we credit that account with, with an amount equal to the power value of the shares. Power value. I know you. I, I, I know uh, you know what is the power value or the nominal value or the power value of the share from company rule. You know what is the power value, nominal value, or the face value of the shares. And then any amount which is above the power value, which is above the power value, then it's a share premium, is a share premium, which should be credited in the share premium account. So this is how we account for that purchase consideration. <clears throat> we account for that purchase consideration, which is paid through share exchange, through share what? Through share exchange, through share exchange. So therefore, these are the various forms of, uh, uh, actually, th those are the three main forms of uh, uh, purchase uh, consideration. 
although we have another one which is known as contingent consideration, which is not very, very common. A contingent consideration is whereby the parent company promised to pay an additional cash uh, to the shareholders of the subsidiary who have accepted to sell their shares but, uh, on the happening of a, a certain event. On the happening of a certain event, it is, a, it is contingent. Uh, it is probable. It is a consideration which depends with the fulfillment or basically occurrence of a certain what event. So it is not very, very uh, common. I want us to, I show you how we, we determine this particular purchase consideration. Just we look on uh, a question here, uh, September 2021. You go to question two. Question two, I want us to just look on the first paragraph of that question. Just first paragraph of that question. First paragraph of that question, I hope you're there. So the question is, um, Chanda Limited acquired 75% of the ordinary share capital of Peta Limited on 1st May 2022 uh, through a, a share exchange of three shares of Chanda Limited for every four shares acquired in Pete. Now, um, this is uh, a company which is Chanda. We are told Chanda Limited acquired 75% of the shares in Pete. Ordinarily, once you come across a question for group account, and there is uh, something you always need to come up with because that will help you in terms of tackling that question. Whatever you need to come up with, we refer to it as a group structure. What is a group structure? Group structure is basically a form of a chart uh, which shows the parent company shareholding in the subsidiary and also the date of acquisition. For example, in that question, we are told that the company which is called Chada, Chada Limited, this company acquired 75%, 75% of the shares in the company which is called Pete Limited on which date? On 1st of May, 2020. So this is now what it part as a group structure. From this group structure, we know that this company here is our parent company where well, last is, is a subsidiary. And also we know that this company acquired a control over this company on this date. First, January, first May 2020. So that is now what we refer to as a group structure. That always what you should have because this helps you uh, in terms of knowing the relationship between these two companies. Now, that being our group structure, it then means that this company, which is our parent company, is under obligation to do what? is an obligation to prepare the group account. Is an obligation to prepare what? A group account, group account. So, but that is not what we want to know. I want to show you how we compute the purchase consideration uh, which is paid through share exchange. Because we are told, uh, Tata Limited acquired 75% of the ordinary shares, share capital of Peter Limited on 1st May 2020 through a share exchange, through a share exchange. So meaning that the purchase consideration was paid through share exchange uh, over three shares of Chanda Limited for every four shares which were acquired in Pete. Now what we need to do here, we need to determine how much was the, uh, or how much was the, uh, was the purchase consideration. The purchase consideration which was paid uh, through share exchange. How much is the purchase consideration. So remember you have said that to compute the purchase consideration which is paid through share exchange, this is the formula which we apply. So we need to determine the number of shares, the number of shares issued by parent company, issued by parent company, and then we multiply that with a fair value or market price per share market price per share, and this is the fair value of the market price per share of uh, which company shares, 
of uh, the parent company shares, parent company shares. So let's proceed and we determine this purchase consideration. We are told, and it, I want us to go through the, the same point again. So we are told, uh, maybe if we go from where we have first May, first May 2020 through share exchange of what? Of uh, three shares, of three what? Three shares, three shares, shares of Chad Limited. So this company was to issue three shares, three shares for every, for every four shares in Pete. For every four shares in Pete. So in other terms, what that means is that Chad Limited was to issue three shares for every four shares, for every four shares uh, which were acquired. For every four shares which were acquired, that's how we, in other terms, we interpret that. Three shares in Chada Limited for every four shares in Pete. This company issued three shares for every four shares it acquired. So the first thing we need to do is to determine how many shares were acquired by uh, Chada Limited in Pete. So first of all, we know we, we have to determine the shares issued by this company, shares issued by Pete. So how do we determine the shares issued by Pete? We go to the balance sheet of this company, the statement of financial position of this company, specifically at the EPT, we check how much was it ordinary share capital. So I think uh, below the, the first paragraph there, we are given the statement of financial position of uh, the statement of financial position of the two companies, uh, we go to the statement of financial position specifically of Pete, and specifically where we have equity. Equity. So under equity, what is the ordinary share capital of Pete? The ordinary share capital of Pete, this one, is 32. This is the ordinary share capital, but in our case, what we are interested with are the shares issued by Pete. How do we determine the shares issued by Pete? we divide that with the par value per share. The par value, if you go to the, where we have the word ordinary share capital, the ordinary share capital of Peter we have said is 32. If you go to where we have the word ordinary share capital, you can see we are told that the par value per share is 10. That a shilling 10 applied to the shares of Chada, applied to the shares of Peter. So meaning that the shares of this company, they have a par value of 10. So we need to divide that with the par value of 10 so that we determine the shares Issued by, issued by Pete. Pete therefore had issued shares which were, had issued uh, 320 million shares. 320 million shares, 320 million shares. These are the shares issued by Pete. But we know that the parent company acquired shares equal to 75% because that's what we're interested with. We want to, to know how many shares were acquired. The shares which were acquired here were 75%. 75% of what? Of 320. Of 320. So we have 75% of 320. So this will give us 240 million. 240 million. So meaning that uh, Chanda Limited acquired 240 million shares in what? In Pete. And because it was to issue three shares, Chanda Limited was to issue three shares for every four shares acquired, then we need to ask ourselves, how many shares were issued uh, out of these 240 million shares which were acquired? So we cross multiply, then we divide three times 240 million. We divide that with four. We divide that with four. We divide that with four. So that will give us what? That will give us 180 million uh, shares. These are the shares uh, which were issued by the parent company to pay the purchase consideration, to pay the purchase consideration. So meaning that uh, we already have this, we have the shares issued by the parent company to pay the purchase consideration. So therefore, the, uh, to compute the value of the purchase consideration, we take the shares which were issued, which were 180 million times the fair value per share the fair value per share. So still in paragraph one of that question, still in paragraph one of that question, in the, in the last sentence of paragraph one, 
we are told on this date, the ordinary shares of uh, Chada Limited and Petter Limited were fair valued at shillings 40 and shillings 20 respectively. So what we, are we interested with? The fair value of uh, parent company, uh, parent company shares, our parent company is Chada. What is the fair value or what was the, the fair value of uh, Chada Limited, Chada Limited shares as per that sentence? It was 40 shillings. It was 40 shillings. So we need to multiply the two. <clears throat> we need to multiply the two so that we determine <coughs> the amount of purchase consideration 180 times 40. So this will give us 7,200 million. So this is the purchase consideration. Now, when to determine the good deal on acquisition of this subsidiary, the Purchase consideration would be 7,200 million. But on the other hand, we have said you should also be able to, or we can also uh, show the accounting entries. Uh, because uh, in the same, same, I think in the same, same paragraph, yes, uh, actually, paragraph two of that question, we are told that the share exchange has not has not yet been recorded by Chada. So these shares uh, which were issued by Chada had not been recorded. Chada Limited never recorded these shares which were issued to pay the purchase consideration. So how was this uh, purchase consideration supposed to be accounted for? Now, Chada Limited, this one, in its books of account, it was supposed to debit an account called investment in Petter Limited, investment in Petter Limited, or it just debit an account called cost of investment a cost of investment uh, with a purchase consideration, with a purchase consideration of 7,200 million, 7,200 million, this purchase consideration. And then uh, this company uh, will credit the ordinary share capital. The amount to be credited here, we have said it will be based on the par value. We know the par value per share is 10, is 10. So we take the shares issued, 1800 or 180 million times 10 times 10 that will give us 1800 million 1800 million and then the difference between the two because you can see the shares were issued at a, a fair value of 40 but their power value is 10 the amount which is above 1800 is a share premium is a share premium the share premium in this case will be equal to the shares issued 18 million, 180 million, that is 180, and then the, times the amount which is above 10. The amount which is above 10 is 30 shillings per share. The shares had a power value of 10, sorry, the shares had a fair value of 10, had a market price of 40, had a market price of 40, but their power value is 10. The amount which is above 10 shillings, which is 30, is the share premium, which is uh, what? which is the 5,400 million, 5,400 what? Million. So that's how we determine the purchase consideration which is paid through share exchange, through share exchange, through share exchange. And also that's how we account for it. That's how we account for such purchase consideration paid uh, through share exchange, through share exchange. Yes, I want you to do the same for this other question here.
April 2022, we have question number what? Yes, so I want you to do the same right now. As we take a short break, you go to this question, April 2022, question 4B, just the first paragraph, from the first paragraph. From the first paragraph, you compute for me the purchase consideration paid through share exchange. As we take a break, I give you 10 minutes to do that. <clears throat>
Yes, what, what, what are you getting? Give me the purchase consideration which was paid through share exchange. Purchase consideration paid through share exchange is how much? I've only received answers from uh, Caro and Elizabeth, Abdul. Man, we are waiting the answers from the rest. I'm waiting for the answers from the rest. Okay, so I'm given the purchase consideration to be 240, uh, to be 240 a million. So therefore, I think that is a purchase consideration. It should also be in a position uh, to account uh, for that purchase consideration. You have seen that that purchase consideration should be debited in account called uh, cost of investment, and then we credit ordinary share capital in an amount of uh, with an amount equal to the power value, the amount which is above the power value is a, is a credited in the share premium, credited in the share premium. So therefore, I think uh, that, or basically that's how we deal with those various forms of uh, purchase word consideration. And I hope you can see that it's very, very common, very, very common uh, <coughs> in your exams. So um, then from there, I think uh, once we meet in our next uh, class, we shall look on how we prepare the consolidated uh, financial statements. Uh, whenever the parent company has made investment in a subsidiary, investment in a subsidiary of which, when the parent company is to prepare these consolidated uh, financial statements, um, in the event the parent company has invested in a subsidiary, then those consolidated financial statements should be prepared based on something called line by line basis. So meaning that if we are told, for example, a certain company has acquired shares, which lies between uh, 51% to 100%, remember you have said that such a company is said to have uh, acquired a control over this company. So this company here, which is the parent company, is the one which has an obligation, 
has an obligation to prepare the group accounts or the consolidated financial statement. Consolidated financial statement. Now, these consolidated uh, financial statements are supposed to be prepared uh, using a certain method, which is known as the full consolidation method. Full consolidation method. And that is in accordance with I, IFRS 10. So meaning that when the parent company, for instance, is to prepare the consolidated statement of financial position, the parent company is supposed to do that by adding, by adding similar items, similar items of assets and what and liabilities, those of the parent and those of the subsidiary, similar items should be combined, should be combined, should be consolidated. And equally, when preparing the consolidated statement of a financial position, sorry, consolidated uh, income statement, the parent company do that by adding, by adding a similar, similar items, <coughs> items of revenue, and expenses, those of the parent and those of the subsidiary, similar items of revenue and expenses, those of the parent and those of the subsidiary should be added together, should be added what? Uh, together, should be added together. Now, what we shall cover in our next uh, class, once we meet, uh, we shall specifically look on how we prepare the consolidated statement of financial position uh, first of all, we look on the steps uh, which are followed. If you come across a question and you're told the parent company has acquired a subsidiary, which steps do you follow to prepare for you to be successfully prepare the consolidated statement of financial position? And also we are going to look on, uh, we shall discuss on some of the consolidation adjustments. Some of the consolidation adjustments. Generally, what we know is that Whenever you have to prepare financial statement at the end of the year, there are those adjustments which are necessary. There are those adjustments which you make uh, to some of the items uh, in those uh, in the in the statement of financial position. But specifically, when preparing a consolidated statement of financial position, uh, there are those. A consolidation adjustment which are necessary. In this case, I think we shall discuss around three consolidation adjustment. One is a consolidation adjustment in respect to something called intercompany debt uh, and lease profit and also the fair value adjustment. That is something we shall discuss in our next uh, class once we meet. And then also we shall look on how we prepare a consolidated income statement. So still uh, in this case, we shall discuss on uh, the same, we shall, we're going to discuss on the steps of preparing a consolidated income statement and which consolidation uh, adjustment, which consolidation adjustment are what uh, are necessary, which consolidation adjustment are necessary. So I think this is uh, what uh, we will discuss in our next uh, class, uh, such that once we have discussed this, then we will be having some uh, good background uh, knowledge and to be able now to handle questions regarding group accounts. And all what we are discussing here is very, very important. This is something you'll come across in those questions for group accounts. You need to know something to do with how we compute the good deal. That is something we have discussed. You need to know how we deal with the various forms of purchase consideration. That is something we have discussed. And also what we shall discuss here, specifically this consolidation adjustment here, which are necessary for preparation of a consolidated statement of financial position, the consolidation adjustment which are necessary in preparation of consolidated income statement, they are very, very important, very, very what? Uh, important. So therefore for today, I think we need to stop at that point. First of all, you need to absorb uh, what you have discussed, the issue to be the good, the issue to be the various for, uh, forms of purchase consideration. Once we meet in our next class, then we shall uh, discuss on uh, what I've highlighted there. But equally, before we meet, I'll be able to share the notes maybe right away, uh, such that we'll be having the notes ready with you. And also, we'll also try to go through uh, what we have uh, discussed for today. So for now, I want us to stop at uh, that particular point, maybe unless there is a uh, uh,
uh, a question. Unless there is a question, I want us to stop at that point. Any question? Do you have any question? Okay, I think there is none. There is none. Have a good night. See you on Sunday.